truth or the principle of the world. I don't know, I see, I was thinking this is stop. No, no. So it is called, uh, the title has been given of Sri Guru and His Grace. Meaning, Sri Guru and His Mercy. Yasya uh, Prasada Bhagavata Prasada. Prasad means mercy. We all know this. Uh, we like to take this mercy in the form of transcendental foodstuffs. But prasad is a very uh, extensive thing, extensive reality. Mercy. So, Srila Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur, he has given this very pertinent and important instruction uh, at the very end of Sri Guru Vashtakam. And there he says, Yasya Prasada, Bhagavat Prasada. If we can gain the mercy of Sri Guru, then we will obtain the mercy of Bhagavan. This is the most important principle in any Vaishnava's devotional life. And then he says, Yasya Prasada Na. If you do not get his mercy, then Kati Kutopi. Uh, your destination is very uncertain. You cannot reach the destination. So, he places this at the end of the Gurvashtakam as the most essential principle to be understood. Uh, so, the foremost duty of a devotee is somehow or other to please the spiritual master, to get his grace, his favor, his mercy, his blessings. Uh, this is the foundation of a devotee's spiritual life. Uh, so, Srila Bhakti Raksha Sridhar Maharaj, he elucidated many, many different topics put together in this booklet, Sri Guru and His Grace, with 14 chapters. And each chapter is like an individual gem, uh, where you can derive so many different uh, essential truths, uh, because Guru Tattva is very vast. To know every aspect of Guru Tattva is a very interesting topic. But we should know that the beginning of spiritual life is to, first of all, establish our sambandha. What is the meaning of sambandha? I'm going to ask someone. Saraswati, what is the meaning of sambandha? Eternal relationship. relationship. It means relation. Relationship. So, we've already heard, especially in the Vedanta Sutra classes, that the whole topic, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also told this fact to Sarva Bhom Bhattacharya here in Jagannath Puri, when he discussed Vedanta with him. And he told there that all of the Vedas are mainly describing three topics. Huh? three categories of knowledge. First is called sambandha. What is my relationship? With who? With what? 
the knowledge of relationship. Without that, you cannot go to the next level of knowledge, which is called abhideya. Abhideya means what actions or activities will I perform in that relationship? Hmm? Because you have to know what is the relationship first, and then you can know what activities you need to do. And the third category is called prayojana. Means the ultimate goal, the ultimate attainment, prayojana. Why are we doing these activities? What is our eternal prospect? What do we hope to gain? What is our goal? So, Srila Gurudev, Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj used to tell very often <coughs> that if you, if you don't fix your goal first, what your goal is, then you cannot determine the process that you will need to follow to attain that goal. Again and again he repeated this. Because sometimes devotees become uh, somewhat blurred in their vision. They're not clear. Why am I doing this process? What is my goal to attain from this process? You see. So, it is essential, here they've said, that first you have to know what is your goal. And then, after that, you can determine now what steps you're going to have to take. What process you're going to have to follow to attain that goal. And one interesting thing that we will find from this Shiguru and His Grace book is that the goal uh, gradually evolves or changes. The vision of the devotee from his initial first stages and as he goes upwards and progresses then his vision will gradually change uh, and the goal which he thought at one point this is my goal it will gradually be adjusted uh, more and more adjusted and it will also be clarified more and more and pinpointed Srila Sridhar Maharaj uses the example that when a military general wants to start a campaign uh, against some uh, opponent, some enemy country, whatever. So, what he does, first of all, is he tries to gather as much information as he can about the enemy, uh, where he is situated, and what are his strengths, what are his weaknesses, uh, all of this information. And then he begins to devise a plan, an overall plan, that how can I attack this enemy and be successful to conquer over this enemy. Uh, so his plan at first is a general plan. It's a very broad plan. It also leaves room for adjusting in many places. Uh, so now, when he actually begins to execute this battle plan, now, uh, so many circumstances arise along the way. He may have some success in one area, he may have some failure in another area, etc., etc. He gains more knowledge, more information, he loses some men, etc. Like this. You can just imagine, you know war. So many things are happening every single day. If we study the Mahabharata, it's very, very interesting. Uh, I was very thrilled when I read Mahabharata and the description of the battle of Kurukshetra. Of course, it's so thrilling because who's fighting there? Sri Krishna himself and his empowered associates. Uh, but the, and the, you know, no, no war, no battle that's ever been uh, 
in history or fictitious battle has ever been as exciting as this. And each day, they meet at the end of the day and they discuss what, what was our achievements, what was our losses, and they devise a plan for the next day. And even the generals, as the generals uh, are lost, they themselves, because they're not weak persons <coughs> like in Kali Yoga, that they sit behind in some office, you know, 10,000 miles away from the battlefield. They're on the battlefield. These are Kshatriyas. And they're so powerful that no one can even touch them. Maharatis. Maha Maharatis. So these personalities, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they are lost. And then they have to select another general and another general. So this was going on like this. So in this way, Sri Maharaj is saying that <coughs> religion means what? What's the word religion? And he's actually quoting Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He says, religion means proper adjustment. Constant. Huh? Constant adjustment. Yes. Constantly adjusting and proper adjustment. And what does that mean? That means that something that is no longer so relevant, gradually it is eliminated. And now there is new acceptance of something that will now help me to go forward. This is the meaning of religion or dharma. From every position, there is a gradual and constant adjustment. And that constant adjustment enables us to uh, clarify our vision more and more and more. What is our goal? Now, our Gurudev is living example of this uh, to an extreme degree. Because his mission, especially, was to come to the Western world where devotees had been engaged now for 20, 30 years or longer in this process. But yet some weakness had come. Some anartas were hampering, some lack of progress forward. So Srila Gurudev, with a very compassionate mood and in a very friendly way, in a very devotional way, he came to inspire the devotees. And he came to tell them that, you know, I have come on behalf of your Guru Maharaj, Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj, to help, to help you. He asked me, he requested me to help. And the help that I want to give to you is that, first of all, I want to tell you that you shouldn't remain in the Kanishta Adhikari stage. That Kanishta Adhikari stage, you shouldn't remain there forever. And he was kind of like trying to wake up the devotees by saying, you know, you cannot remain Kanishta forever. Because why? There is a misconception that now, this, what we've attained, this is enough. You know, there's still many devotees thinking, we, we did it already. We served Prabhupada when we were young, or we served our other guru when we were young, and uh, we're always remembering how we sacrificed in this way and that way. And we're still trying to chant 16 rounds and follow the four regular principles. Maybe we're not doing so good at it, but nevertheless, you know, and we sacrificed, so therefore, uh, we're going back to Godhead. Prabhupada told us we're going back to Godhead. But what's happened is they have become stagnant. Stagnation. Srila Gurudev gave the example, you know, of a pond of water. Now, in villages in India, other parts of the world, under underdeveloped countries, they, they have a pond of water in their village. And that pond supplies them with the water for all their needs. For their drinking water, cooking water, for water for their cows, their, their bathing water, their washing their clothes, like that. So sometimes the ponds are not so big also. So uh, it's like a tradition. We live in this village. 
and my father and his father and so forth, they all use this pond. But if that pond of water at some point, you know, because of stagnation, it actually becomes contaminated, uh, which is unhealthy, which is not really fulfilling your needs, true needs any longer. But if you still insist that, no, this is the pond that my father drank from, this is the pond that my grandfather, I, we will continue to drink from this pond. What is this? The foolishness. Lack of proper knowledge. So in this way, uh, there should be some adjustment going on in every day's <coughs> spiritual lives, every day. Uh, where Dave said you should take stock uh, at the end of the day. What you have gained, what you, how you have not come up to the standard, and like this, then you can practice. You can try to apply the processes more diligently, more sincerely like this. So Gurudev, he came and he wanted to help the devotees to become inspired. And the most inspiring thing is to understand that what kind of prospect do we actually have as devotees? What is our ultimate attainment? What is this thing called Krishna praying? Gore Prem. Uh, what is the transcendental world? What are the different divisions of Prem? And studying this topic, especially the highest feature of Bhagavan in the form of uh, Sri Nanda Nandan Krishna, how he sports in Sri Vrindavan, as we've been hearing so nicely from. Sri Dandi Maharaj, all these beautiful, sweet uh, brush pastimes uh, and all the commentaries of the acharyas. So that world, that transcendental world, it is our goal that we want to attain. Uh, but from our position, we'll have to determine what we'll have to do to attain that goal. And we'll have to check, we'll have to examine uh, am I going <coughs> towards that goal? Am I lagging behind? Am I sliding backwards? Uh, uh, like this. So what is favorable? What is favorable? This is called Sharanagati. Sharanagati has six limbs. Uh, first limb is Anukaliya Sisankampa. Whatever is favorable, if I'm actually surrendering to Guru and Krishna, then this has to be the very foundation of my spiritual life. Uh, that I will become aware of what is favorable, what is not favorable. What must I do to advance? And what is not favorable? What is? Haribo! Haribo! Chu 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 what is not favorable? Pratikulya vivarjana. Pratikulya. Uh, if I'm doing things that are unfavorable for bhakti, what will happen to me? Oh, definitely my bhakti will diminish. There is no doubt whatsoever. But uh, the tendency of the conditioned soul is to somehow or other concoct and justify and uh, imagination that I can do these unfavorable things but I can still be a devotee and I can still advance. This is a very big anartha. Uh, it's, it's in the category of um, uh, what is it called again? Uh, sadhana sad, sadhya sadhana uh, tattva brahma sadhya sadhana tattva brahma Tattva Brahm means bewilderment about tattva, truth. There are four different types of such anarthas. And one of them is sadhana, sadhya sadhana tattva Brahm. To not know what is the proper uh, goal and what is the process to attain it. So the 
conditioned souls in the material world, when they come to any pathway of seeking after knowledge of the Absolute, uh, they always have their own contaminated backgrounds that they bring into the process. Uh, and without proper guidance, without proper association, and even with proper association, those tendencies are very strong, these anartas. And they encroach upon, they cover over like in a jungle. The jungle becomes very tangled. So they cover over. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually used the example of weeds. Weeds which are growing next to a plant. The plant is called the Bhakti Lata, the creeper, the divine vine, Lata, which is growing towards Goloka Vrindavan. That's the destination, the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, to serve him there forever. And so that vine, once it becomes stronger, it can stand on its own. Uh, but in the beginning stages, there are many things that can hamper the growth. So if anybody has done gardening, then you know that when you plant a, a seed and a, you're trying to nurture a plant, then you have to also become a good gardener, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells to Rupa Goswami. He says, now the devotee has to become mali, means gardener. And that means that you're very vigilant to watch and see, are there any other <coughs> Uh, plants, namely weeds, undesirable plants that are growing up next to this original creeper plant. And what do you have to do as soon as you see them? You don't wait for some time. Oh, let it grow for some time. I'll cut it out. I'll cut it out later. Or you also don't just cut it off like at the ground level. I'll cut away the weeds. No, what do you have to do? You have to uproot the weeds because they'll grow back. They'll grow back again and again and again and again. So you have to take them up from the roots. So this is a very important process in a devotee's spiritual life. Uh, and if a devotee doesn't have proper favorable association, very difficult, especially in the neophyte stage, to keep up the proper standard. So the devotee can easily, uh, gradually, these weeds can come and cover over the bhakti lata and drain uh, the nourishment of your watering process. What is the watering process? Mahaprabhu told, Shravan Kirtan Jale. That means the, the water of hearing and chanting. Uh, Shravan Kirtan, this is the water. If we don't do Shravan Kirtan, plant will not grow, and it will gradually dry up. It's a fact, and we see it all the time. <laughs> if someone is not going out with their hearing and chanting about Krishna, and that means chanting your japa, chanting the maha mantra, chanting in kirtan, hearing and chanting shastra, the Krishna kata, being in very favorable association for this, and that this will go on continually. And then when this is going on, then your lata, your bhakti lata is getting watered. We can all feel this. Just like this, uh, this festival, this <coughs> academy. What is its purpose? Same purpose that Gurudev told when he had his festivals around the world. So now we have come here to engage in very intensive hearing and chanting, in very favorable association. Huh? And therefore he wanted to pack the whole day from morning to evening with constant classes and kirtans and all. Because this is the most powerful thing for our bhakti. There's nothing more favorable. <coughs> Srila Sridhar Maharaj, in his book, another book called Prapanna Jivanamrita, uh, this is a book that he himself wrote, and he also wrote Sanskrit verses in this book, and then he also compiled many, many shlokas from all the different shastras, and he organized it in chapters to describe uh, each, in one chapter, the, one of the six limbs of bhakti. And the first limb being anukulyasya, 
Anukulya Sisankalpa, meaning accepting everything that's favorable. So at the very beginning of that chapter, he quotes the first verse from Sikshastaka. Cheto Darpana Marjana He quotes the whole verse. And then he begins to express that there is nothing as favorable as Krishna Kirtan. Nothing can be as favorable as this. So that means all your chanting and hearing on your own <coughs> private bhajan, your sangha with other Vaishnavas. So any devotee who's actually truly serious that he wants to make the most of his spiritual life and he wants to move forward and make spiritual advancement continually, <coughs> then that devotee will somehow or other arrange that they're doing this to the maximum degree in their life, right? <coughs> that they're doing this hearing and chanting, shravanam kirtanam, and that will lead to all the other limbs of bhakti. Gurudev also told, uh, as he traveled, he would always announce and and uh, invite devotees everywhere to come uh, across the oceans and come to the holy dham, Sri Vrindavan dham, Raj Mandala Parikrama and attend one month during the auspicious month of Kartik, Shimati Radhika's month, in the association of exalted Vaishnavas in the highest dham at the most auspicious time, huh? being surrounded by all sincere Vaishnav sadhakas and using your time fully from morning till evening, fully absorbed in all these activities of visiting Krishna's Leela Stalis in the Dham yeah? and inundating your hearts with all of these impressions. So this powerful activity, uh, he would invite everyone to come. And he also told, I want this to continue after I leave this world. I want this to continue. So if devotees are really trying to take full advantage of this human form of life, then they will utilize all opportunities. They will make their residence in a favorable place where there are other Vaishnavas. They will associate with them in a favorable manner. Not that I just live around the devotees in a particular town, but I do my own thing and I'm always just, you know, uh, doing what pleases my senses. Eh, maybe once in a while for a festival I'll come to the temple. What is that called? It's called stagnation. Yes. So, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastri Kray. This is the theme of a devotee's life. It is mentioned in this verse three times, Mahaprabhu himself told. All the Shastras, they're all calling out. Sarva Shastri Kray. Kray means calling out to us, announcing to us. Associate with sadhus, sadhu sangha. Associate with sadhus, Vaishnavas. Because, lava matra sadhu sangha, sarva siddhi hoy. Even if you have only a tiny amount of such very powerful, auspicious sangha in your life, then what happens to you? You will go quickly on the pathway to all spiritual perfection. Sarva Siddhi Hoy. All perfection. It will come through Sarva Sangha. So the process has been given. <coughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his associates, and especially Srila Gurudev always told us there are two books. Two small books, which if the devotee reads them very carefully, very diligently, and learns these 
books and applies them in their life, then they can proceed very nicely on the pathway to attaining the ultimate treasure goal that is attainable by the jiva, namely Krishna Pray, Braja Pray. And what are those two books? Sri Upadesha Rita, that's the first book, and Mana Siksha. Mana Siksha. And by the way, you can't read these books too often. You cannot uh, expose yourself to the information in these books too much. Uh, it is just like Bhagavad Gita. You can read it unlimitedly. These two little books with 11 verses each, these two books are the entire process from bottom all the way to the ultimate top. There are different tops, but this is the ultimate top, Radha Dasya. That is the pinnacle of all of our acharyas' ultimate aspirations. Radha Dasya. That's a whole wonderful topic. Srila uh, Sridhar Maharaj in his, his book, Sri Guru and His Grace, the last chapter, very wonderful chapter, is called The Line of Sri Rupa. How many of you have read that before? One, two, three. Okay. The Line of Sri Rupa. And that's where he begins to talk about this subject of how the devotee's vision will gradually change. Uh, what, is, what is his ultimate goal? At first he will think that the ultimate goal is Bhagavan. Uh, and then which form of Bhagavan? And then, which, and then in which abode of Bhagavan? And gradually, gradually, becoming more and more adjusted, adjusted, adjusted. Another very nice thing that <laughs> Sridhar Maharaj told us is that <coughs> the Siksha Guru principle is like a telescope. Now, there's a whole chapter in here about Siksha Guru. Uh, but he said it is, it is like a telescope because the telescope is manufactured with many, many lenses, not just one lens that you're looking through, but a whole succession of lenses which help to continue to magnify more and more and more and more and more. So, that telescope can clarify something at a very great distance. You can bring it into view. So in the same way, the Siksha Guru system, it is meant to gradually evolve and clarify our spiritual vision. What is the goal? What is the process to attain it? What, what is my current position? Madhurya Kadambani, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, what are the different stages I have to go through? Looking at your own sadhana bhajan like a mirror in front of yourself, where am I at at the present moment? Hmm? So through the process of Siksha Guru, then the process of Diksha that we have been given by Guru, it becomes accomplished through that. Without the Siksha, the Diksha will never happen. And in this book also, Srila Sridhar Maharaj has a chapter regarding uh, the Siksha Guru disciplic succession. Because our Guru Parampara system is not a system of pure Diksha succession. In other words, that one Diksha Guru gives uh, initiation to another, to a disciple, and then he gives initiation to another, and this goes on in an unbroken chain. Although there, these kind of chains are there, but Srila Sridhar Maharaj explains that these are not uh, the actual transmission of the potency of the Guru Parampara. He explains that the Guru Parampara system is like uh, in, you know, Western modern scientific, scientific uh, research and discovery. So this goes on over a period of hundreds of years. And there are so many thousands and thousands over centuries of scientists who are also engaging in utilizing the knowledge that some great scientists discovered. 
uh, and then they do experimentation and research, and then they uh, make a little progress. Uh, but you do not mention all of the scientists. What you mention is what? Uh, when you want to understand that scientific uh, succession of knowledge, what do you mention? You only mention the great scientists who have landmark discoveries. Copernicus and, and uh, Newton and Einstein and so forth, like this. So he says in the same way, the transcendental knowledge is distributed through a succession of siksha process, meaning divine uh, uh, instructions, siksha, spiritual instruction. So the instructing spiritual master uh, is indispensable. Uh, one cannot just take initiation, okay, and then say, now I have my guru, now I'm just going to follow what he says, and disregarding all other Vaishnavas and all other great personalities, uh, previous acharyas, all of this. No. One will have to have input from many, many different sources. And ultimately, our knowledge will lead us to understanding how Guru is not just coming from one person. The principle of a guru is not just coming from one, my guru, but there is a contribution coming from many, many different personalities. Yes. Srila Siddharam's quotes, and I'm going to read it now. He quotes from uh, Sri Guru and His Grace, the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. I wish I had the book here because it's not so easy to jump around. And from, so, but anyway, we don't have the book. So just give me a moment. Uh, okay. This is chapter 11. This is called The Land of Gurus, he, the title. The Land of Gurus. What would you think by the title when you hear that there's a land of gurus? There are many gurus. Yeah, there's a, there's a place where there's lots of gurus. <laughs> but how many gurus? What kind of gurus? How do I enter that land? So now listen carefully. We're going to hear from his lotus mouth. He says, In the Srimad Bhagavatam 11th canto, 9th chapter, 31st verse, it is stated, Na ke kasmad guror gyanam sustiram syat supushkalam. So, this is part of the verse. It's saying, One certainly cannot get complete knowledge from only one guru. Na hi ekasmad gurur jnana. Not from one guru can one get complete knowledge. Interesting point. Interesting point. Now he will elucidate this in such an amazing way. He says, in the highest stage of devotion, uh, what is the highest stage of devotion? Yeah, Prem Bhakti. And coming up to that, Bhav Bhakti. Approaching that realm where you enter into Krishna's Leela. So he says, in the highest stage of devotion, we must see not only one Guru, we must see that Guru is everywhere. Everywhere. Guru everywhere. This is the highest stage of devotion. How is that? He says, in the land of Krishna, all are gurus. The land of Krishna. There's a lot of entities in the land of Krishna. What entities are there? Huh? The whole dham 
Everything in the Dham, every entity in the Dham, animate and inanimate, so-called. Like, here we call it animate and inanimate, with life and without life, because the sky, the ocean, the land, it's inanimate objects. But actually, in the spiritual world, there is no such thing as inanimate, <laughs> because everything is conscious there, everything. Even the dust particles are persons, conscious. It's quite, you know, ex uh, uh, una it's, it's quite distant from our ability to envision that. We don't have any experience of that. <laughs> so, he says, everything in the spiritual world, the entire environment, is our guru. And we are servants. So, everything there. And my position? Only servant. Servant of all. So in the land of Krishna, all are gurus. So our transformation should be towards that. As we transform in our spiritual quest, and these adjustments come, uh, and our progress comes, what will we do? Uh, our attitude will be to grasp and realize this truth that all are gurus in that land. <clears throat> so he says to enter into Vaikuntha or Goloka, it means that on all sides we must see guru and we must pay our respects. There is a gradation of course, but all are gurus. So, gradation of gurus, yes, different levels, uh, different connections that I'm having, but all are guru. <clears throat> now he says there are different classes of guru. All Vaishnavas are considered gurus, yes. All Vaishnavas are considered gurus. And when he speaks of Vaishnavas, he's talking about actual Vaishnavas. But all Vaishnavas of the higher caliber, uh, high level Madhyam, or even Madhyam to the Kanishta, uh, all are gurus. So, now he says, if the spiritual master gives even one letter to the disciple, he says, what is contained in that one letter is infinite. But to know and to understand it fully, what is in that one letter? Different sources are necessary. So in the highest position, when one reaches the highest position, one is able to read devotion to Krishna from everywhere. Huh? Oh, wherever you gaze, wherever you look, you see devotion to Krishna. What is that? That's called Uttam. The Uttam platform. Uttam Adhikar. Sarva Bhuteshu Yad Pashyad Bhagavad Bhagavad Bhavam Atmanaha. Sarva Bhuteshu Yad Pashyad. Wherever the Uttam Adhikari looks, wherever he gazes, even in this material world, what does he see? He sees that all, all living beings are properly s situated because all living beings have this bhav of service to Krishna, love of Krishna. Why? Because in his heart, he has this highest mood of devotion, and his vision has expanded to the infinite degree that all are actually serving Krishna, even if they are in the lower world, this Maya world of birth and death, but still, they're serving Krishna. So that's an extraordinary vision, which is incomprehensible to us. How is it that they're all serving Krishna, and how can it be seen like that? They're not conscious of Krishna. But the pure devotee, he actually sees the, that mood that is within his heart, and he sees it within the hearts of the other living entities. And this is why, this is why, it is said that the Uttam Adhikari, he doesn't take any effort to preach because he sees that everything is properly adjusted. Quieter. He's, 
sees that everything is properly adjusted. So therefore there's no need for me to try to change. Because they're already serving Krishna. They already have the mood of service to Krishna. So we know that uh, in order for that Uttam Adhikari, Mahabhagwat, he's called the Mahabhagwat. When you want to use the word Mahabhagwat, this is what it means. It means Uttam Adhikari. He's no longer a conditioned soul in this world at all. It has nothing at all to do with his body, with his senses, external senses. Hmm? Uh, he is fully absorbed day and night in the service of Krishna, in his rasa. Uh, and internally, he's living in the transcendental world, meditating on Krishna's astakali and lila, and serving Krishna internally, 24 hours. This is Buddha. No one can imitate Buddha externally by trying to act like an Uttam Adhikari. Oh, I see that this particular Uttam Adhikari is uh, talking to his deities. Uh, so I'll also talk to my deities. You cannot do it. This is like Vamshi Vadana. Uh, Vamshi Vadana. Das uh, Babaji, Thakur. He was a contemporary living at the time of Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And he had an extraordinary nature. Actually, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he had such regard for this Vaishnava who was living completely as an avadut. Completely. Uh, he had no uh, concern, shaving, even sometimes bathing. Uh, he was not bound by any kind of rules and regulations at all. And he had two deities of Gornitai, Garanga Nityananda. And actually his mood towards them was filled with a lot of Vatsalian mood, that they were like his young boys. And he would talk to them. He was totally servant, serving them 24 hours, 24 hours. He would do pujas to them. He would talk to them. And they would talk to him, but you could not hear that. He would have conversations with his deities. And sometimes he would also chastise his deities. Oh, very good. Thank you. So, one time, you know, because he would actually, he would wander here and there. Uh, suddenly he'd just go here and there. And there are gradually some people. There's a little nice book you can read about his life, a small book. And he, he, he would sometimes attract different people who wanted to stay around him. But he really wouldn't talk to them very much at all. If they asked him something, he'd just look at his deities and he'd talk to his deities. Or he'd answer their questions by talking to his deities. So he was like totally in another plane of reality. The transcendental plane. He was living in Navadweep. And, 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 and these persons who were around him, they erected a tent. Huh? So he would sometimes stay in the tent. But then suddenly he'd just start walking, carrying his deities. He'd just start walking. And they'd have to pack up the tent and go wherever he was going. Huh? Sometimes he would follow Ekadasi for four days or longer. Huh? When it wasn't Ekadasi. So he was living in a transcendental realm. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, and actually even, and this is what Sahajiyas love, they love to hear that, oh, this very great Mahabhagwat, he had a hookah, and he used to smoke. So they say, oh, you know, Om Shri Varam, uh, Om Shri Das Babaji Maharaj, he smoked, so we can smoke that huh? Bogus rascals. Put fish bones around. Yeah, he'd also put fish bones around where he was. Why? Keep people away. <laughs> Keep the mundane materialists away. But when he would, uh, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, of all Paramahansa Mahabhagwas, he had such regard for him, he would send his disciples to Calcutta to bring first class smoking tobacco for him. And when he would smoke on the hookah, 
he would make the gurgling sound and he would gor, 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 Can this be understood by a mundane, materialistic, prakritist Sahajiya Bhakta? No. But they want to imitate. So, one time, there was a plate that Vamshi Das Thakur used for offering, his offering plate to Gorli Thai. And because he never paid any attention to the paraphernalia that was there, someone stole this plate. It was maybe some good quality metals or something. They stole it. So then Vamshi Das, he looked at his deities and he began talking to them. And he said, I know. I know that Nitai, you have stolen this plate. Huh? So today you will not eat. Gore will eat, but not you. Such love and affection. And for one or two days he wouldn't feed Nitai. But then suddenly his heart would break down and he would weep. And then again he would start feeding his deities. Can you imitate this? Don't even think about it. Because if you even think about it, you'll become degraded. That is how high these personalities are in this world. So therefore, Rupa Goswami has written in the Upadesham Rita one verse to give us a guideline to not be so foolish like this and to look at such an exalted personality with mundane vision. There he's telling, Drishtai Swabhava Janitayar Vapushas Chado Shayar Naprakri Tatvam Ihabakta Janasya Pashyed. Don't see this Bhakta who is in that high position with a mundane vision. Hmm? He says there, huh? don't see his Swabhav. His, his, you know, Swabhav actually means the like your personality, in Western terminology, your personality. You know, we all have our own particular personality and our personality quirks and traits and, you know, like this. So, because they take birth in the material world, they also have a personality. But that personality, you should not, you should not judge or examine what is the nature of their personality. Oh, he doesn't talk very much. He's too grave. Oh, his, his body is getting old and infirm. Huh? Oh, he has a rough sounding voice. He doesn't sing melodiously when he sings. And this and that and this and that. Examining from your mundane vision whether he is qualified huh? or not. This is a great offense. Great offense. Huh? This is called Hati Mata. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu warned that when you're growing your bhakti creeper in the garden, you should guard against this offense more than any other. And more than any other. Why? Because this offense is called the maddened elephant offense. If an elephant becomes, you know, goes out of its mind and starts rampaging through a garden, you know, mad elephant, and it's making their loud sounds that the elephant makes and it's destroying everything in every direction and then it sees this one particular vine growing up from the ground and with its trunk it rips it out of the ground, puts it on the ground and stamps on it. Finished. That's what Mahaprabhu told. It's called Vaishnava Aparad. It can destroy everything and we have seen it. <laughs> Many times, many times we have seen it. Why? Because most devotees are in the neophyte stage. What is the neophyte stage? Kanishta. And they're described in the 11th canto as Prakrita Bhaktas. Prakrita Bhaktas. They're Bhaktas. But they're on the material level. Prakrita. And what is their attributes? Archayam eva haraye pujam yakshradaye hate. They're bhaktas, they're devotees because they have shraddha, they have faith in the deity form of the Lord. They have faith. 
you see. And they have faith also in the spiritual master. Because the spiritual master is representative of Bhagavan. So the proper Bhakta, he can, he can collect his faith and he can perform worship with some faith uh, to the Lord. But the next trait, the next uh, quality of the Kanishta is that Natad Bhakteshu, Natad Bhakteshu Chanyeshu. That means that he doesn't have the same faith towards the Bhaktas. And Bhaktas are of different levels. Uh, Kanishta, Madhyam, Uttam, and Gurudev always used to say that in each level, three levels, there are many, many, many levels. So he can't see the bhaktas. He, has, he doesn't have the vision to decipher. This is a kanishta, this is a mandyam, this is a nuttam. I should deal with him in, in this more respectful way, or I should just respect him in my mind. So Rupa Goswami writes an entire verse about this, the fifth verse in Upadesha Amrita. Uh, he tells how on each level, uh, how does that begin again? Krishnaiti Yasya Giritam Manasa For the Kanishta Bhakta, you should always offer him respect, but in your mind. Manasa Adriyeta. You should offer uh, this mood of respect in your mind, not disrespecting. Even if you see that this devotee is uh, on a very low level and he doesn't know very much, has very little knowledge, but he has faith in Krishna, he has faith in chanting Harinam. So you must offer your respect to that jiva. It's an offense not to, in your mind, respect the jiva. And then when the, in the Madhyam level, Dikshasti chet pranati bis cha bhajantam isham. Now here's the description of Madhyam. A Madhyam Adhikari, he's doing bhajan. He's absorbed, actually, 24 hours a day in doing bhajan. To who? To the uh, Ishtadeva, Isha, the Supreme Lord, his worshipable object. Dikshasti uh, Chait. And he has accepted Diksha. So, the Diksha process is going on, and Diksha means Divyam Gyanam Tato Dadya Kurya Papasya Sankshayam. That actually he's attaining some Divya Gyan. Divya Gyan is coming to him, divine knowledge. Tattva Gyan. Huh? And knowledge of Siddhanta, Tattva Siddhanta, is coming into his heart for the Madhya Madhikari. So he's, he's really in the process of Diksha, very well <coughs> moving forward in the process of Diksha. And Kurya Papasya Sankshayam, previous Anartas and so many are gradually being evaporated and extinguished. Huh? Kuryat papasya sankshayam, previous sinful reactions and karmas, they're gradually getting eliminated and cleared. So that Vaishnava, uh, who is in that stage, Rupa Goswami says, Dikshasti chait, pranati bish. That means you must offer your physical dandava pranams to, that, to such a Vaishnava from your heart. You must respect that Vaishnava in that way more than you only respect in your mind to the Kanishta. Otherwise, offense will be there. And then he says for the Uttam, Shu uh, Shu Shaya, Vajana Vigyam, Ananyam Anya, Nindadi Shunya, Hridaya, Ipsita Sangalabhya. Now he says that this Uttam Adhikari, Vaishnava, he has certain uh, internal and external traits. What is that? That Bhajana uh, Vigyam Bhajana Vigyam means fully realized in the process of performing uh, bhakti process to attain praying. He's in the stage of bhav. He's no longer in sadhana bhakti stage. He is a siddha bhakta. But now, his whole goal is to attain uh, Krishna praying, 
to attain that intensively. He's constantly striving. And Bhajana Vidya means that 24 hours he's internally absorbed day and night, day and night in his internal Siddha Swarupa, his perfected spiritual form huh, of his eternal relationship with Krishna. And he is in the Dham within his heart, serving 24 hours daily. Huh? And Ananya Anya Vigyam Ananya Manya Nindadi. Huh? That means that he is Ananya, meaning that he has nothing else 24 hours, not even a speck of non devotional thoughts, words, feelings, moods, everything. Everything is pure bhakti, uttama bhakti in his life. And it's, it's going on 24 hours and flowing unbroken stream. Huh? This is definition. Anukulyena Krishna Anu Shilanam. And Shilanam means constant cultivation, 24 hours daily. So really, Uttama Bhakti can really only be done by such a personality. But preliminary to that, one can begin to enter into that stage uh, where he is absorbed 24 hours. Now, it says here, Nindadi Shunya. In the heart of such a Vaishnava, there is no tendency at all to find faults of others, to criticize others. Ninda means to criticize, to find fault. Uttam has no symptoms of this whatsoever, 100% free from this tendency. And Ninda Adi, what does Adi mean? It means all the other undesirable qualities, such as Kam, Krod, Loba, Moha, Mada, Matsarya, uh, lust, anger, greed, illusion, envy, madness, and many, many other. He has nothing in his heart at all. Uh, nothing in his heart at all of this. Nindani Shunya. Shunya means zero. He has zero of this effect in his heart. So therefore, Sangha Labdhya Labdhya. That means that association, that Sangha of such a person is extremely desirable. It is to be sought after. Uh, and what do you do in that association? Shru Shru Shaya. Very significant word. In Bhagavatam, it is there in the beginning. Shru 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 Shadadamasya. Shru Shru Shaya means you hear from him, but not just hearing, surrendering your life at his lotus feet, serving, inquiring, taking him as master. So Srila Srila Maharaj is telling here that all such Vaishnavas are guru. And if we don't respect them in this way, then we will be subject to committing the mad elephant offense of Vaishnava Parad, and we've seen what happens. Huh? So therefore, uh, the land of gurus will continue reading it in the next class, which is on the first Monday. Monday. There will be four more classes. Okay, Monday through Thursday, before we go to Navadvi. And I'll continue in this Shri Guru and His Grace. What I'm trying to do actually is just draw from my heart and uh, you know what I've understood and it, it's leading to so many different topics in relation to this but I will be reading more and then we'll really go deeply into this topic the land of gurus how to understand uh, that we can take advantage in this world from other Vaishnavas who are also worshipping our Ishtadeva who are in our line who are affectionate to us and who are far superior to ourselves. This should be the aspiration of any genuine, sincere Vaishnava. Wherever, the, wherever they find such qualification in this society or that place or this person, where we find that, uh, then a sincere Vaishnava will aspire to go there and receive that 
exalted Sadhu Sangha and will also try to render service there and to take in very deeply what he is giving. So in this way, if we, our spiritual life is guided by these principles of always sincerely endeavoring to get Sadhu Sangha, then gradually our spiritual life will progress very, very smoothly and very nicely. But if we neglect these principles, so many anarthas will come up, so many weeds will come up, our devotional creeper will be hampered, and then we can even fall from the path, or we can go away for some time and neglect it. Even, even it's possible to become a Mayamani. Hmm? So, therefore, uh, we should follow the safe path. And therefore, uh, what Srila Rupa Goswami has said, the six favorable activities, Utsahan Nishayat Dariyat, Tatat Karma Pravartana, Sangha Tyago, Satol Vrite, Sadvir Bhakti Prasidyati. Doing these six favorable activities, at the end of this list of six is Satol Vrite. It means to always follow in the footsteps of the previous acharyas, what standards they have set, what, what uh, examples they have shown. And just like last night, Srila Bharti Maharaj, she was telling us so much wonderful kata about how he had the opportunity to associate with so many senior exalted disciples of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Our Guru Dev Sensei, he had so much opportunity, he had many, many Siksha Gurus. <clears throat> he heard from them and he served all of them. You see? So, and he was telling us how they were so detached, how they all showed this highest example of just pure devotion. They were never got caught up in trying to fight for temples and this and that. And he even illustrated that even if there was a little court case, the objective was only that, oh, this property should be used for the service of the Lord. No other thing like this. So, we are very fortunate because we've come in this line. This, you know, Saraswat, uh, Gaudiya line, of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, this Bhakti Vinod Dhara of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, everything is here. There's no need to go outside of this line. Uh, yes, there are other lines coming down from Mahaprabhu and his associates, but this line is the so powerful and living line which is giving this movement to the entire world uh, and all the great Vaishnavas descending into this world who, who are coming to give a push. So this is a very uh, vibrant spiritual line of transcendental knowledge flowing in this line. We are very fortunate that we have taken initiation and now we have to lead our lives in such a way that we will always be properly following our Guru. And if we follow our Guru, then what will happen? Yasya Prasada, Bhagavad Prasada. We'll get his mercy, and then we'll get Krishna's mercy, and everything will be accomplished. Gaur Premana. Jai Shri Shri Guru Tattva Ki Jai Shri Bhakti Rakshak Shri Dhar Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai Shri Rupanuga Guru Varga Ki Jai Anand Kodi Vaishnava Vrinda Ki Jai